Until its earliest days, Chicago had been known for vice, corruption, and murder. It was not a very pleasant area from the very beginning. A low, wide expanse of slogs and bogs. The river was full of wild rice. The banks teemed with skunk cabbage. This is why the natives called the area Chicago, meaning bad smell. At one time, the mouth of the Chicago River emptied into Lake Michigan, just east of Michigan Avenue. Over where the Tribune Tower now stands is where the area's first permanent non-native resident, John DeSable, lived. Originally from Haiti, he arrived in 1779 and lived there until 1800. When he headed west, DeSable's property was purchased by Jean Levine, the land speculator William Burnett. Mr. Levine moved in, becoming the city's first European settler. He lived there until 1804 when Burnett sold the property to John Kinsey, another of his agents. The line moved across the river into the newly constructed Fort Dearborn. There he worked as an interpreter for the army. Kinsey, an Indian trader, went on to become the unelected leader of the settlement that soon grew around the fort. In 1810, Kinsey and the commander of the fort, Captain John Whistler, became embroiled in a dispute over to Kinsey supplying alcohol to the Indians. In April of that year, Whistler and the other senior officers at the fort were removed and Whistler was replaced as commandant by Captain Nathan Held. On June 17, 1812, Gene Lalion became Chicago's first murder victim when he was stabbed by John Kinsey. Kinsey was exonerated by an inquest held by Captain Held, but speculation was Lalion was a spy informing on corruption going on at the fort. The Americans and British were fighting the War of 1812 at the time, and throughout the Northwest Territory, Indian tribes were joining the British to fight the invading Americans. By August 12th, local Indian tribes, the Potawatomi and Winnedale, had surrounded the fort with hundreds of braves, far outnumbering the few of the 100 soldiers manning the fort. Captain Held struck a deal with the Indian chief for a safe passage in exchange for whiskey and guns. When they heard of the deal, Held's officers rose in revolt against this bargain, and the weapons were destroyed, and the whiskey poured into the river. On the 15th of August, legendary Indian scout Captain Billy Wells arrived at the fort. Wells was a white man raised by the Miami Indian tribe and was accompanied by 30 of the Miami warriors. That evening, another council was held, and the Americans were told they would be allowed to flee to Fort Way some 150 miles away as long as they left right away. After spending the night packing, the troops and settlers set off the next day. They only got about a mile and a half near where Prairie and 18th Street is today when they were attacked by some 500 Potawatomi who had been escorting them. It was a savage, bloody slaughter that killed most of the fleeing Europeans, and those who weren't killed outright were captured and sold into slavery. Captain Held and his wife were captured and transported to Mackinac, where they were turned over to the British commander there. John Kinsey and his family were also spared due to his business dealings with the tribes. He returned to Chicago a year later and worked as a trader and Indian interpreter until his death in 1828. Fort Dearborn was burned to the ground by the notorious Indians with the bodies of the massacre of victims left scattered to decay in the sand dunes of Lake Michigan. The bodies were given proper burials by replacement troops when they arrived a year later. By the end of the century, this area will become an enclave for the city's wealthy elite after the Great Chicago Fire. As for the Indians, the price for the massacre would be high for those natives who had existed peacefully with the white settlers before the war. Memories of the slaughter led to the removal of them from the region, and by 1833, their forced removal from the Chicago area was complete.